Hello, and welcome to this tutorial on nonlinear ultrasonic propagation. Before we go on to consider nonlinear effects, it's useful to remind ourselves what we mean by linear acoustic propagation. And we'll start by considering the linear equation of state for linear acoustic waves in fluids. On the left hand side, we have a pressure change. And we can see that there's a linear relationship between that pressure change and the density change divided by ambient density. In fact, this quotient is often referred to as the condensation. For small signal perturbations, where we have small pressure changes, there's a simple linear relationship where the constant of linearity relates to the ambient density and the ambient wave speed squared. But as the magnitude of those pressure changes increases, we find that this relationship is no longer appropriate, and we need to consider additional terms in the Taylor series expansion. So much so that as we include quadratic, cubic, and higher order terms, we can see that there are multiple coefficients involving powers of the condensation. Let's remind ourselves also how propagation in various media happens. When we're looking at a gaseous medium, where we have particles that are well distributed with a large distance from one particle or molecule to another, as an acoustic wave propagates, there's a finite and considerable time for one particle to interact with the next, and therefore the wave speed through these media tends to be quite slow. In a slightly more organised material, like a liquid, particles tend to be much closer together, and therefore as a wave propagates, Particle-particle interactions require less time and less distance to occur, and we can get an increase in wave speeds. Finally, in solid media, where particles are very close together and very highly organised, waves can propagate very rapidly because of the short distances needed for one particle to move to interact with the next. This leads to very fast wave speeds. So now let's consider the basics of nonlinear propagation. And here we'll consider a pressure wave as a function of distance. This wave will take the form of a sinusoid, and we'll assume that there's an arbitrarily defined linearity threshold. In practice, this isn't a simple cutoff point as drawn here, but for the purposes of illustration, we'll assume that once we cross this threshold, we'll start to see nonlinear behavior. It's also important to realise that positive pressure excursions are compressional in nature and negative pressure excursions are tensional in nature. So when a wave starts to exceed the threshold of linearity, we notice that in the compressional area, we're forcing molecules locally together so that they have a tendency to become locally more solid. The more solid like nature results in an increase in wave speed. And so the compressional portion of the waveform that exceeds this linearity threshold will have a tendency to want to accelerate relative to the rest of the waveform. In contrast, in the tensional phases, we're pulling molecules apart, making the material locally more gaseous. And in this region, the part of the waveform will want to move locally slower than the rest of the waveform. So as a result, the compressional phase would have the tendency to move to the right and the tensional phase to the left. This results in waveform distortion. We can see that we've got some energy has bunched up towards that zero crossing point. Notice, however, that this means that as the wave has propagated a little further, we're even further above that linearity threshold. So as we consider the wave a little further on, on its propagation, we have even more in the tendency to, for this compressional phase to move to the right, and an increased tendency for the tensional phase to move to the left relative to the rest of the waveform, and even more distortion. And this carries on and on and on, until into the ideal case, we end up with a sawtooth wave, which has got a fully formed shock front. Now, this is the theoretical situation, 
But in practice, there tends to be some dispersion going on, which changes the nature of these. So let's consider an ideal shocked waveform. In practice, notice that this is reversed left to right because we are now plotting the waveform as a function of time rather than as distance. And the dispersion that goes on, so the change of propagation wave speed as a function of frequency, means that there is an additional phase term that actually results in a waveform distortion that has got a very characteristic sharp peak positive excursion, but a very much more rounded peak negative excursion. One of the quantities that's used to, to consider in this context is the shock parameter. It's given in the equation here, and we notice that this relates the ambient wave speed, the pressure, frequency, but also propagation distance. So without changing the pressure or the ambient pressure, the frequency, or any of the other density and wave speed parameters, we find that a waveform will become ever more shocked as propagation distance increases. This is exactly what we saw in the previous illustration. Note also that there's a term here, V over 2A. These are exactly the V and A constants that we saw in the Taylor series expansion at the beginning of this video. Let's look at some examples of that shock wave evolution. And these are experimental data recorded at a range of distances. So we can see that at 75 millimeters from the transducer source, which is operating at one megahertz, we have a degree of asymmetry between the positive and negative going excursions, but it's slight. As we propagate further and further away, so that now our Z distance is 125 millimeters from the transducer, there's noticeable difference between the positive and negative going excursions. And eventually, at 200 millimeters away, we can see that we have got nearly four times the positive excursion that we do peak negative excursion. Given that we have got changes to waveform shape, such as is shown here, we would realistically expect this to have a manifestation in the frequency domain. Now this fundamental was a one megahertz fundamental, and therefore we would normally expect to see a spectral spike at one megahertz. The sharp peaks, however, are also likely to give rise to a requirement for further harmonic content. And if we look at the spectrum of this waveform, not only do we find a clear peak at one megahertz, but also many other peaks extending over a very broad band range, in this case to 120 megahertz, all of which are at integer multiples of the fundamental frequency. For a tone burst, these tend to be well-defined spectral peaks. If we had a short broadband pulse that was propagating non-linearly, then we would expect to see multiples of each band. So that, for example, if the center frequency of the pulse was three megahertz, but extended from say one to four megahertz bandwidth, we would expect to see multiples of that as we extended up in frequency with increasing nonlinearity. But another phenomena is ongoing as well, and this is the absorption in the medium of propagation. If we look here at the absorption in pure water, we can see that there is a quadratic dependency on frequency. This leads to a curious behavior. As we increase our propagation distance, we would expect to see an increase in peak positive frequency, so peak positive pressure. This in turn leads to an increase of higher frequency energy. And we know that at higher frequencies, there's going to be greater absorption. But because energy is now being absorbed preferentially at these higher frequencies, we find that this ends up reducing the maximum pressure. As a result, there's a dynamic equilibrium. So as we propagate further from the transducer, initially more and more energy is being pumped into higher, higher harmonics, which are being absorbed preferentially, which eventually means that we lose our distortion 
in the peak positive and peak negative excursions because the high frequency energy is being dissipated in the medium. And eventually, at great distances from the transducer, we return to a simple waveform with just the fundamental frequency spectrum. It's also useful to be able to look at waveforms and identify whether we have nonlinearity that's present. And for simplicity's sake, I will define this to a simple weak shock situation and a fully shocked waveform. Looking initially at the temporal waveform, we notice that in the weak shock situation, we do have a little asymmetry between peak positive and peak negative, but it's typically only of the order of 1.5 to 1, or perhaps a little more. Below 1.5 to 1, and it may be difficult to accurately determine whether we've got nonlinearity or not, simply due to uncertainties in our measurement. However, by the time we look at the bandwidth, we can see that there are a few spectral harmonics that have arisen from this waveform distortion that we're starting to notice. Compare this with a fully shocked waveform, where we could easily see in excess of 3 to 1, asymmetry between our peak positive and peak negative ratios. And the bandwidth is likely to contain many harmonics indeed. To summarize then, shocked waveforms need both enough pressure and distance to form. And nonlinear waveforms may have very broadband spectra indeed. We hope you found this tutorial interesting. If you have, Please come back and find some more of the Precision Acoustics video tutorial series.